In this lecture, I'm going to talk to you about roles and processes in schools. Now, what that means is it's about the systems and um, the school, what happens within schools that can affect a student's achievement as well as their experience of education as a whole. And we're going to talk about um, the ideal pupil. We're going to uh, bring in labelling theory, which you'll remember from um, doing perspectives. We're going to look at groupings in schools and how both labelling and grouping within schools can affect the achievement and experience a child, a student has within the education system. Now, for this uh, lecture, there are a number of studies that we will be looking at. Um, and you do, you, although you don't need to know the years in which they were done, it's helpful to, but you do need to know who did it, how they, what they did and what they found out for those studies. And this can be used as application in any um, exam question or essay that you write. So first of all, so we're going to start talking, first of all, looking at labelling. Now, labelling is very much an unconscious process within schools. And what I mean by that is that it's not something that is um, dis necessarily discussed or determined. There's no formal attachment of labels. It's not like the sorting hat in Harry Potter where um, you're put into your different houses and the, those different houses have certain attributes. Um, it's more a way of a teacher to um, understand the class that's in front of them. So you've got a class of 30 and this labelling process allows a teacher to understand who is in front of them so that they're able to shape their teaching to that class, which is quite a positive way of looking at labelling. There is a negative side to it as well. Um, which can lead to um, students being anti-school and things like that. So a label can be attached, a negative label can be attached. And because of the treatment due to that label, it can lead to negative outcomes such as poor academic achievement, poor behaviour or a negative experience of education for the student. There are a number of different factors which play into the attachment of a label. So it's not just one thing that says, oh, you're like that then. It's a combination of both um, attributes and personalities and information that can create that label. So the first one we're going to discuss is gender. And this links very closely into the gender role socialization idea and that girls and boys are socialized differently. Girls are socialized often into what's referred to as the bedroom culture. And the bedroom culture is this idea that girls are protected, they're kept indoors, very passive, very calm, very quiet. They spend, they talk, they read, they're creative we're in terms of arts and crafts, baking and things like that. Whereas boys are socialized to be more rambunctious, to be outgoing and adventurous, risk taking, to be more aggressive, um, to communicate more physically rather than verbally. Um, and this can play into how teachers then see the class in front of them. So if you've got a class that's more boy heavy, you would perhaps treat that class and the students in those classes differently to a class that is more girl heavy. And then different again, if you've got a more 50-50 split. But that gender role socialization and those gender role norms will shape how initially how teachers will see um, students in front of them. The next one is social class and with social class it's not that stu teachers know your um, students financial backgrounds or their family financial backgrounds but there are certain things that can indicate class and one of them is language codes 
and Bernstein talks about the um, restricted and the elaborated codes. So the elaborate code, yeah, oops, is associated with the middle classes. And the elaborate code refers to language that is wide in vocabulary, grammatically complex, varied and often abstract um, in nature and is context free. You can understand what somebody is talking about without being given necessarily a lot of context. Whereas the restricted code is often associated with the working class and that is more um, grammatically simple, sentences are a lot shorter, it's very contextually bound, um, it tends to be very literal in the way that um, people with the restricted code tend to speak. And what Bernstein doesn't say is that one is um, the elaborate code is better than the restricted code. He doesn't say that, although it's kind of implied. What he says what is that there is these different ways of speaking. And he points out that the um, elaborate code is the code of the education system, um, meaning that the way that schools are built, if you like, um, is around the elaborate code, the way textbooks are written, the way teachers speak, the way that um, the brochures and things like that are all, are all written, tend to be towards the elaborate code. Now, this is probably because a lot of teachers are middle class. Um, so th that's a natural way for those people to speak. But because of that, it can create a label that perhaps the working class aren't as intelligent as the middle classes. Um, and that's not to say that's true, it, the, or it may be that the working class might, or those with a restricted language code can find it difficult to access education. And that doesn't mean that they're less intelligent. It just means that they take a little bit longer to process the information because it's not necessarily in a format that they would readily understand. Similarly to somebody whose English is perhaps a second, second language. It's not that they don't know the answers or they're not intelligent, they just might need that little bit more time to process and understand what's being said. So translating what's being said to them in order to be able to respond. But because people who are um, English native speakers, they're not necessarily given that processing time and it can lead to the label of perhaps being less intelligent or less academically able. Um, the next one we look at is ethnicity and ethnicity, we, we will talk about this in a lot more detail later on, but it does link into the idea of institutional racism and unconscious bias. Now, when we're talking about unconscious bias, we're not talking about teachers who are outright racists um, and saying that all teachers are outright racists. We're not saying that at all. Um, what we're saying is that um, stereotypes of uh, certain ethnicities can lead to labelling, which can lead to differences in educational achievement. Um, and these na these racial stereotypes, um, they are being broken down. They are being uh, and teachers and educational training establishments are um, training staff to be aware of their unconscious biases and to try and counter those to be more neutral. And this is the same with labelling overall is more and more teachers and, and educational training um, providers are teaching and talking about labelling in schools to so that they can become 
less labelled. Um, I can't think of another way of putting it. But so that if we're aware that we do this, then we can, when those labels perhaps are a little bit more negative, um, we can counteract that. And we can kind of go, no, okay, this is my unconscious bias, or this is um, um, a, a stereotype, a label that I'm attaching, and I need to stop doing that. Okay, if the label, so, but positive labeling can lead to positive outcomes, so possibly not all labeling. Okay, we also need to think about behavior in class. Now, this is one of the later elements which will come into um, the creation of the label because obviously it's the interaction between the teacher and the student that will, will will create this so a student comes in they're polite they're respectful they do the work they're going to possibly be late they're going to be labeled more positively a student comes in who's um aggressive or um at behaving in a way that is um not allowed in the classroom that's against the the process the rules of the lesson or um, refuses to do the work is um, disruptive etc they're going to perhaps get a more negative label so you can kind of see that as being a natural progression your the label that is attached to you is attached to the behavior that you have demonstrated now obviously this in-class behavior could link to other labels such as the social class gender or ethnicity and some of the other um, factors we're going to talk about but it's almost the if you like the cementing um, factor we also talk about previous teachers now as i said before we don't sit around and um, formally put labels on you but teachers do talk we do talk to each other if you move schools, reports are written to to your teach to the new school to to let them know what sort of student you are. And um, at the start of the year, when we get our registers and things like that, you kind of look through and you kind of see who you've got. And you might be talking to people, and it's like, oh yeah, I had that person last year. They're absolutely brilliant, such a lovely person, so wonderful. Did all their work, um, went above and beyond. Or they might be going, oh my god, they're such a nightmare oh god they, they were disruptive they were a pain in the backside um so we we do talk as teachers and even if it's not at the beginning of the year when we get our registers there are certain names that people know um and which links into our next one which is reputation there are certain students where you say the name and people will either will, will know who you mean even if they haven't taught them um and that could be an individual where you kind of go, oh, so I had such and so and so today, and everyone, oh, they're so lovely, oh, they're so nice, I like them. Or it could be, oh my god, yeah, I know who you mean. Um, and it can be more negative. But that reputation could also be linked to a family name. So it's sort of like you, you kind of see the name, the surname on the register, and you kind of go, I wonder if they're related to so and so. So you check the system, and you kind of go, oh yeah, I, I know that family. Um, and that, again, it can be positive, it can be negative. Um, I mean, when I was at secondary school, a lot of my teachers taught my parents as well. They, they taught both my mum and my stepdad. And um, I imagine that they had ideas about who I was and who what was coming into the school when I joined. Because my older sister was already there, my aunts and uncles went to that school, my cousins went to that school. There's a reason I left um the area but um that kind of reputation can also impact how a teacher interacts with a student and it does work the other way around we're not just when we're talking about labeling it's not just teachers on students it could be the other way around as well um teachers have reputations and it's you kind of go oh I've, you look at your timetable at the beginning of the year and kind of oh, i've got so and so for whatever subject Oh, I had them last year. They're so horrible. They're so not. Da, 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 da. Or oh, they're really lovely. They're really sweet, and they they do nice things, and they're a really good teacher, and things like that. So the labelling can go both ways, especially with the with um, reputation. We do need to think about data as well, and the idea of how because we do have data. We have your grades um, from 
previous years. We have reports that we can look at. Um, we, we know if you've got special educational needs, not a phrase I like particularly, but if you have additional needs, if you've got, um, if perhaps you had a, a bad year for some external or extraneous reason. So the, the, the data also plays into it. So it's kind of like, oh, well, that, that student's predicted uh, or targeted a low grade. So um, when they get a low grade on assessment, yeah, well, they're still within their target. So, but whereas another student who perhaps is targeted a bit higher, they get a low grade, it's like, well, what's going on here? Rather than it being kind of, okay, you've got your assessment grade and let's see where we go from here. It can, that can change the um, the experience. So we the all of these factors plus many many more can create this label. Now Hargreaves um, talks about the stages of labeling, and so it doesn't just happen all in one go. He first talks about the this the um, first stage being speculation. So some of these um, factors such as gender, ethnicity, um, reputation, all of these things can formulate a speculative label. Then when you're in lessons, you've got the in-class behavior, you've got the data, the kind of language code kind of thing, which is considered elaboration. So you've got speculation, then you've got elaboration, and then through more and more interaction with the student, between the student and the teacher, that creates the, what he referred to as stabilisation. So the lab, there's a speculative label in the elaboration phase that can then change or it can kind of reinforce the, um, the label that's been speculated on. And then through more and more interaction, we get this stabilisation. So speculation, elaboration, stabilization is how the, the, the label is formed. Now, Becker um, talks about the ideal pupil. And what he means by this is how as teachers, we have an idea in our heads about the perfect student, what they look like, how they behave, what their academic ability is like. And it's almost like this um, ghost pupil, if you like, that lives in our heads and all other students need to, to kind of live up to. And this can be um, given out to students in terms of, and I do this in sociology, it's kind of like, if you want to be, if you want to do well at sociology, these are the characteristics I'm looking for. I'm looking for somebody who engages in discussion, I'm looking for um, somebody who's curious about the world around them, somebody who is willing to um, read and apply their knowledge to the world around them, things like that. They, those are, um, in my head, what makes the ideal sociology student. And the, this ideal pupil, this ideal student that lives in a teacher's head or it lives in my head, is the measuring stick by which we measure all other students by. And so if you're living up to that ideal pupil, you probably get a positive label. If you're not doing what is in my head as the ideal student, that could lead to a negative label. So it's almost like a, a guideline, if you like, of what am I looking for in students in my classroom? If What am I looking for in, for students to behave and to um, be academically inclined to and that can again feed into the the labeling and the um, attachment of labels to students in a classroom now this could be again as i said it could be positive and it could be negative so there have been lots of studies into labelling. As I said, it's now becoming more and more part of the teacher training programme, CPD and things like that, um, as trying to identify this labelling process and maybe 
um, not necessarily counteract it because it is a human um, way of doing things, but more kind of be aware, have an awareness of it. So the first one was done by Ray Rist um, in the US. And what Ray Rist did was he went into a um, kindergarten school and he looked at how a teacher um, used home backgrounds to group or segregate students. Um, and this, this particular school, they had the Tigers, who were neat, middle class, fast, academically able students. You then had the Cardinals, who were the middling students, um, some working class, some middle classes. They, they were OK. They're the kind of what are sometimes referred to, referred to as the gliders. They do just they do what they need to do to get through. They don't excel. They don't underachieve. They just glide through the education system. And then you had the clownfish who were troublesome students. They were the ones who were from poorer, working class, deprived backgrounds. They would be the ones that would perhaps come to school without equipment, um, poorly dressed, things like that. And what Rist found was he followed these students over a number of years through their prim kindergarten primary education into their secondary high school education. And he found that these labels that had been attached to them in pretty much their first year of school followed them throughout the rest of their education. And um, so those that were in the clownfish group were still labelled as troublesome, low academic achievers, even by the time they got to high school 10 years later um, or eight years later or however long it was. Um, and those who were tigers had been pushed into advanced placement courses, which we don't have in the UK. Um, they were student council. They, they were excelling within education. So we can see that those labels from very early on in your education can really impact your educational experience and your educational outcomes. The second study comes from Hempel Jorgensen. God, I love sociology names. Um, and he or he pointed out that the ideal pupil varies not just between individual teachers, but also between types of school. Um, and about and it varies depending on the social makeup of the school. So, for example, in Aspen, um, the town in the US, working in a working class school, where discipline was a problem, the ideal pupil was quiet, passive and obedient. Whereas in another town not far away, which was called Rowan, which was more middle class, um, there were few disciplinary problems. So the ideal pupil here was defined by personality and academic ability rather than behaviour. Um, so what we can see here is this, this determination of ideal pupil, which shapes the label that is attached, whether the label is positive or negative, can be sh different depending on the school that you look at. So, for example, Wyndham College is quite middle class school, although we're all, we are rural Norfolk, we're, we're quite international. So we tend to see the ideal pupil as somebody who's engaged in Wyndham life activities, somebody who is working hard, they're neat, they have equipment, they do extracurricular clubs. Um, they're involved and because of the boarding side of Wyndham College we, we do very much push that kind of getting involved in wider school life whereas the school I worked at in London which was quite a deprived school where we did have a lot of behaviour problems the ideal pupil in that school was again it was passive quiet not disruptive quietly plodding along and getting through Okay. That then brings us to kind of the idea of in-school groupings. Now, in-school groupings can be linked very much to labelling. They not only can be caused by labelling, but they can also um, create the label. 
so we've got another study here which is Rosenthal and Jacobson which is it was called Pygmalion in the classroom now this is a classic study and ethically very dodgy um so what Rosenthal and Jacobson did this this was referred to as a field experiment so if you need an example for a field experiment this is the one and what they did was they went into this school and they gave fake IQ tests to the students so they looked real um, and the students took them and then what Rosenthal and Jacobson did was they randomized the students and picked 20 percent of them and those students that completely random picked out of a hat well computer program um were identified as bright students the the bloomers they called them and um the bottom another 10 percent was identified as the bottom half of the year they, they didn't do very well on this iq test and rosenthal and jacobson told the school the results of this test and then came back a year later retested the students to see how these the the progress of these students um over the course of the year to see whether or not that label of bloomer or less able had actually impacted the education of those children and this is why it's slightly unethical because it does impact their education those students who were identified as being bloomers as being the top 20 percent made more progress than the other students the middle group or the um, lower ability group and those that were in the lower ability group tended to regress in terms of the testing so they did the initial fake iq test to begin with came back a year later retested the students to see what changes had made now as i said it is unethical and it is unethical because it negatively impacted the education of some of those students but what they also found out is that the, that data that was used also created in class in school groupings now there are four ways that group schools group students in schools the first and you've probably experienced some of these yourselves the first is setting and what happens in setting is within each subject area you are in say top middle and bottom okay so you might be top english middle maths bottom french uh, middle science top art so on and so forth okay so you're you're set according by ability within individual subjects now this can be seen as a good thing because it can mean that those who are more able can be stretched and those who are less able can be nurtured and the middle group can be taught appropriately um however as we've seen with labeling that that being told your bottom set maths can have a negative impact because in like well i can't do maths i'm bottom set i can't do it um so it, it can can be both positive and negative the next one is streaming and this is where you're placed in um ability groupings but the same ability grouping for all subjects so we used to have it here at the college where you were red and um, green or blue band so red band were the top students green band were the middle students blue band were the lower ability students and that would um link to your gcse subjects that you could take it would link to what groupings you were in in terms of um sets and things like that and it's th similar to kind of impacts as setting now a lot of schools have got rid of this um because of the negative labeling attached to it so we no longer have streaming we do still have sets in certain subjects but usually that is linked to exam papers that people are sitting so for example in science we have the triple group which is higher ability and we have double award science which are which is everybody else um in it used to be it you'd have um foundation paper intermediate paper and higher paper for certain gcse's and that would link to the sets and streams that you were placed in you also have in-class groupings where teachers will put people in groups according to ability within their own classrooms 
um, which again can mean that you perhaps you give something a little bit more complicated or a little more comp um, difficult to those who are more able um, compared to those who perhaps needed a little bit more support. But generally in education today, we see much more mixed ability teaching. So for example, it doesn't matter whether you're um, targeted a nine, a GCSE or an A star, an A level or an E or a one, you'd be in the same class. Now, for some people that is a good thing because it means that everybody is more equal opportunity education, but for others, it can be seen as a negative. It can be seen as more work for teachers because they've got to differentiate more. They've got to kind of, they've got to scaffold it enough for the lower ability, but they've also got to stretch and challenge the higher ability. Um, so it can, and it can be seen as a positive because the lower ability have got the higher ability to support, help them and push them. And they're not seen as being lower ability and, and unable. But again, it could be that the lower ability perhaps sees the higher ability and kind of goes, well, I can't do that. So why am I bothering? Um, or the, the higher ability are being kept behind while people try and while the lower ability keep ca catch up. Now, I'm not a big fan of those phrases, but I'm using them because that's what you, the, the easiest way to to describe it. Keddy did a study where um, he applied the idea of pre uh, the speculative labeling to in school groupings and Keddy found that those students who were speculatively labeled as underachieving were put in lower streams and sets and this then became um, self-fulfilling prophecy which i'll talk about in a minute because they were in lower streams and sets, they, they weren't given access to the knowledge necessary for them to achieve higher in education. They weren't given the opportunity to show what they could do. So the speculative labelling that we were talking about from Hargreaves showed in Keddie's study that those students who were speculatively labelled as low ability, probably based on data, prior reports, things like that, would then be put in lower sets and streams, which would then lead to educational underachievement. So I've already talked about this idea of self-fulfilling prophecy. This is reactions to the, this is how people react to the label. And um, it can sometimes be forgotten that there is a process to the labeling. It's not a case of label attached. That's going to lead to that behavior. So what we can talk about is linking back to Hargreaves idea of speculation, elaboration and um, whatever the third one was, um, you've got the teacher who speculates about the student and creates this picture in their mind of what the student is like, usually shaped by the ideal pupil that they have in their minds. When they meet that student, when they interact with that student, they that label shapes that interaction and creates um, how the teacher interacts with that student. But then we get into what's called the negotiation phase. And it's not necessarily a case of just because you're treated a certain way, you're going to behave accordingly. Now that, that can happen. And that's what we call the self-fulfilling prophecy. So the student accepts the label and internalizes it, creating a master status which then they live up to. So they're labeled as high achieving. They kind of go, yeah, OK, I'm high achieving. Yeah, that's all good. They internalize that. I'm a good student. I'm brilliant at whatever subject it is. And then they live up to that label. They, they, they act according to that label. Could obviously go the other way as well, where a student is labeled as a troublemaker or as um low ability they kind of go okay that's what you think of me that's what i'm going to do and they internalize that and do that but the negotiation phase can go the other way as well it can go to the student turning around going no you think i'm like that i'm going to prove you wrong and this is a key study by margaret fuller who looked at um afro-caribbean girls in a london school 
who had been labelled negatively by teachers or by the education system and they were just kind of like, yeah, no. And they weren't doing it to... Um, they, they, they rejected the label and were almost kind of like, well, you think I can't do it? Well, watch me. I'm going to do it anyway. I'm going to achieve well. Showing that stu just because a label is attached doesn't necessarily mean it's going to stabilise. So that elaboration phase in Hargreaves' three-step system is what we refer in uh, self-fulfilling prophecy phase is what we call the negotiation phase. It, which elements of that label are the students going to accept and internalise? Which ones are they going to reject and kind of do the opposite to, if you like? So a self-fulfilling prophecy isn't necessarily guaranteed. It all depends on how the student reacts to the label that they've been given. Now, if we have a look at this graphic, we can kind of see how it might link, how it can link into educational achievement and um, experiences of school. So positively labelled student A, they're hardworking, they're focused, they're engaged, they're doing everything they're supposed to do. Because of that, they join a pro-school subculture. We're going to talk about subcultures in, in the next lecture, but they, they're the kind of ones who are accepting of school rules they want to do they get their status from doing well in school be it academically be it in the wider um, community of the school through school councils and, and, and things like that they are given high expectations in terms of their behavior they're put into higher sets and streams they develop a studious intellectual self-concept i am a good student i need to prove myself as a good student i need to maintain that good student um, role and that can lead to high grades uh, in any external exams whether that be GCSEs or A levels. Now student B who's been negatively labelled as label, lazy, less able, distractive, troublesome develops a self-contact con their concept about around non-school activities so they're achieving status through out through um, things outside of school. Um, they the school has low expectations of them. So instead of um, you can get top grades, you can do really well. So like, okay, you got a you got a four. That's good for you. That that's a good grade for you. Um, and I really hate that phrase. Um, and they tend to join retreatist or intransient subcultures or an anti-school subculture, where it's kind of like I can't get status kudos or whatever through academic achievement or through school activities so i'm going to get it by being the class clown by being a bully by um being disruptive and those sort of behaviors and that can lead to middling averaging or low gcse grades because they don't see their status links to their educational achievement their status comes from other parts of their life whereas positive student a is getting their um, status through that academic achievement through their um, collegiate um, achievements so what we can see here is that the labeling process and which links to the gr in class grouping process can create a an experience of the education system that could be fantastic it could be negative and that experience and that label can also link into whether a student does well in school or whether they do not so well in school but it's not guaranteed and that's the thing i need you to remember is it's not guaranteed students can can accept the labels that are attached to them they can reject them these labels are not fixed they are constantly negotiated and renegotiated so think reflexive the reflexive self from giddings okay so roles and processes in schools we talked about the ideal pupil and becca's idea of um, the ideal pupil there is the generic 
view of the ideal pupil but each teacher will have in their minds the ideal pupil for their own students as well um, the different ways that school students are grouped in school setting streaming in class and mixed ability we attach labeling theory to education talking about how there's the speculative label which is elaborated on and then you have the negotiation phase as to whether that label is stabilized and internalized or whether it's rejected and possibly reformatted okay and we've got those key studies from rosenthal and jacobson rist jorgensen and keddy which kind of reinforce those ideas